I don't look like that. Son, as principal, I think of myself as the father of this school. Do you follow me? Sure. Yeah, you think the students are your children. What? No. The students are my children. The school is my child. And you attacked my child today. You punched it in the face. What kind of a person punches a child in the face? That was a very important assembly, and you ruined it. I know. I'm sorry. Honestly, I was just doodling. All right. Rule number 26. Read it out loud, please. Rule 26. Any written material deemed inappropriate or offensive will be confiscated and destroyed. And destroyed. Very good. Very good reader. All right. Goodbye, offensive and inappropriate material. Hold on. Please, you don't understand. These drawings mean everything to me. In that case. You guys are doomed. Bye-bye. This super stinks. Tech support. Here we go. Tech support. Your new principal sucks. <laughs> This is Michael Faulkner, and it is showtime at the October 4th, 2016 edition of the Weekly Body of Plex. Brought to you on the Chronic Rift Network. Welcome to October. Autumn is here. Pumpkins are here. Halloween is almost here. It's a beautiful time of year. This week's birthdays include Alicia Vikander from Ex Machina, Melissa Benoist, one of my favorite Supergirls, Alicia Silverstone, who once played Batgirl, Kate Winslet, star of a plethora of dramas, scientist Neil deGrasse Tyson, Elizabeth Shue, who I will always remember as Allie from Karate Kid, and Sigourney Weaver, the actress who has saved the world so many times on film and knows that safety lights are for dudes. Starting with the box office report, the newbies did fairly well. At number 10 is Snowden, sliding 5 from 5th. At number 9 is Bridget Jones's Baby, also sliding 5, but from 4th. In 8th is Don't Breathe, down 1 from 7th. In 7th is The Queen of Catway, jumping up 15 from last week's 22nd as it enters wide release. And finishing up this week's bottom 5 is new release Masterminds, fizzling with $6.5 million. Long story short, critics gave it a 36% rating, audiences gave it a B-. Even Aaron Peterson from the Hollywood Outsider podcast disliked it. We're moving on. The top five this week begin with Sully, down two from third with $8.3 million at a total of $105.3 million. In fourth place is Storks, down two from second with $13.5 million at a total of $38.5 million. In third place is last week's winner, The Magnificent Seven, adding $15.6 million to a total of $61.5 million. In second is new release Deepwater Horizon, debuting at $20.2 million. Opening audiences were enthralled with an A- cinema score, and critics were equally impressed with an 83% fresh rating. Analysts are tracking this one for a final run around $70 million. Flying into first this week is Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, premiering to $28.9 million. The number one isn't all puppy dogs and marshmallows, as audiences and critics were only mildly impressed, offering a B plus and a 64% respectively. Audiences under 25 stood out with an A- cinema score, but they probably won't be enough to keep the film on top for the weeks to come, since that demographic was barely in the majority. Let's close out the box office report with the liquid winning years gone by. Five years ago in 2011, Real Steel took number one with $27.3 million, breaking Rocky IV's record for the highest weekend debut for a boxing film. Ten years ago in 2006, The Departed won the weekend with $26.9 million. Twenty years ago in 1996, The First Wives Club was the winner for a third and final week with $11 million. Thirty years ago in 1986, Crocodile Dundee took the title for a second week with $8.2 million. And forty years ago in 1976, The Front took the box office crown for a third and final week with $2.8 million. The box office premieres for October 7th are starting the month with comedy, thrills, and a film that shares a name with one of America's most controversial movies. 
Starting with this week's headliner, Middle School, The Worst Years of My Life. A comedy starring Lauren Graham, Griffin Gluck, and Rob Riggle. My name is Rafe Cachadorian. And welcome to my first day of middle school. Mom, she's doing it again. She's gonna get me arrested. Hello, not getting any younger here. Do that again and you're not getting any older either. Imaginative, quiet teenager Rafe Cachadorian is tired of his middle school's obsession with the rules at the expense of any and all creativity. Desperate to shake things up, Rafe and his best friends have come up with a plan. Break every single rule in the school and let the students run wild. Middle School, The Worst Years of My Life is rated PG. The second title is The Girl on the Train, a thriller starring Emily Blunt, Haley Bennett, and Rebecca Ferguson. I saw someone with Megan Hipwell, but uh, not on Friday night. She... She was having an affair. She had a lover. That's that's what I'm trying to tell you. I thought you. you didn't know her. No, but I but I saw her. You saw her where? I, I saw her from the train. She was standing on on the deck with this with man. Her husband, Scott Hipwell. No, it wasn't him. This man was different, and they, they were they were kissing. Wow, that's pretty coincidental, isn't it? You just happened to be on a train at the same exact moment that a woman you don't know but somehow recognize is cheating on her husband. I know it sounds crazy. Neighbor um, saw a, a drunk woman in the vicinity of her house Friday night. Megan Hipwell does bear a resemblance to Anna Watson. Mrs. Watson reported that you go to their house sometimes uninvited and that on one occasion you actually broke in and took their child. A divorcee becomes entangled in a missing persons investigation that promises to send shockwaves throughout her life. The girl on the train is rated R. And the last wide release is The Birth of a Nation, a biographical drama starring Nate Parker, Army Hammer, and Mark Boone Jr. We've been good to you. My whole family has. And you go on and do something like this to me. A n of baptizing a white man on my property. Do you know how this makes us look? This could ruin everything we worked for. Boy, you'd better say something and quick. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Ex exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering you again. You are bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. He that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. But is in danger. Beware of false prophets who come dressed in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. Nat Turner, a literate slave and preacher in the antebellum South, orchestrates an uprising. The birth of a nation is rated R. Okay, I'm going to stop the podcast right here, and I'm going to point out that I cannot find a connection between this year's birth of a nation film and the notorious 1915 silent film of the same name. Besides that title and the setting of the American Civil War. Now, if you don't know, the 1915 film, The Birth of a Nation, was pretty groundbreaking. It was the first 12 real film in America. It ran just over two hours with an intermission. It was the first American film to be screened at the White House, and it was preserved as a culturally significant film by the United States Library of Congress. That said, it's also highly controversial because of its portrayals of black men as unintelligent, sexually aggressive savages, and because it portrays the Ku Klux Klan as a heroic force for good. Now, for this film, producer and director Nate Parker has stated that he has, quote, reclaimed this title and repurposed it as a tool to challenge racism and white supremacy in America to inspire a riotous disposition toward any and all injustice in this country and abroad, and to promote the kind of honest confrontation that will galvanize our society toward healing and sustained systemic change, end quote. Long story short, the entire reason I'm bringing any of this up on the podcast, I think the title may be a stumbling block for people who are going to see this film. All I'm asking for is a little bit of honesty. If you're interested in the film or the message that Nate Parker said he wants to provide, I'm going to pull another page from Aaron Peterson's book at the Hollywood Outsider podcast. I'm asking you to give this version a shot on its own merits, not based on minor connections to one of the most troubling films in our history. That's all I'm asking. End of PSA. There's also one title on this week's limited slate, and you can find that one in the show notes. 
Next up is a look at the home entertainment slate for the week of October 4th, and we'll kick things off with newly released on DVD and Blu-ray, and that list begins with X-Men Apocalypse, a drama starring James McAvoy, Michael Fassbender, and Jennifer Lawrence. Billed as the third entry in the X-Men Beginnings trilogy, with the emergence of the world's first mutant, Apocalypse, the X-Men must unite to defeat his extinction-level plan. X-Men Apocalypse is rated PG-13. The second title is The Purge, Election Year, a thriller starring Frank Grillo, Elizabeth Mitchell, and McKelty Williamson. Years after sparing the man who killed his son, former police sergeant Barnes has become head of security for Senator Charlie Roan, a presidential candidate targeted for death on Purge Night due to her vow to eliminate the Purge. The Purge, Election Year is rated R. And the third title is Sharknado, The Fourth Awakens. An asylum film starring Ian Ziering, Tara Reid, and David Hasselhoff. Five years after the East Coast was ravaged in Sharknado 3, Finn and his family have been blissfully Sharknado free. But now sharks and NATOs are being whipped up in places and ways that are completely unexpected. Sharknado The Fourth Awakens is rated TV 14. Swinging by new releases on digital video, we have one title there. That's Star Trek Beyond, an action drama starring Chris Pine, Zachary Quinto, and Carl Urban. The first leg of the USS Enterprise's five-year mission takes them into uncharted territory. There, the Enterprise is nearly destroyed and strands Kirk and his crew on a remote planet with no means of communication. Kirk must then work with the elements to reunite his crew and get back to Earth. Star Trek Beyond is rated PG-13. Moving right along to TV on DVD and Blu-ray, we start things there with Preacher, Season 1 from 2016, starring Dominic Cooper, Joseph Gilgan, and Ruth Nega. Preacher tells the story of Jesse Custer, a preacher in the small Texas town of Anvil. Custer is accidentally possessed by the supernatural creature named Genesis in an incident which killed his entire congregation and flattened his church. Genesis, the product of an unauthorized, unnatural coupling of an angel and a demon, is an infant with no sense of individual will. However, as it is composed of both pure goodness and pure evil, it might have enough power to rival that of God himself. The second TV title is American Horror Story, Season 5, Hotel from 2015, starring Kathy Bates, Sarah Paulson, and Evan Peters. A string of grisly murders is traced back to the sinister, sensuous Countess, an infamous resident of the stylish Hotel Cortez in downtown Los Angeles, as played by Lady Gaga in a Golden Globe winning role.
Number three on the list is a long-awaited title. That one is Constantine, the complete series from 2014, starring Matt Ryan, Angelica Saleya, and Charles Halford. Based on the wildly popular comic book character from DC Comics, seasoned demon hunter and master of the occult John Constantine is armed with a ferocious knowledge of the dark arts and a wickedly naughty wit. He fights the good fight, or at least he did. With his soul already damned to hell, he's decided to abandon his campaign against evil until a series of events thrusts him back into the fray, and he'll do whatever it takes to protect the innocent. With the balance of good and evil on the line, Constantine will use his skills to travel the country, find the supernatural terrors that threaten our world, and send them back to where they belong. After that, who knows? Maybe there's hope for him and his soul after all. And the final TV title this week is Penny Dreadful, Season 3 from 2015, starring Timothy Dalton, Ava Green, and Josh Hartnett. In Season 3 of Penny Dreadful, Vanessa Ives accepting her demons could plunge the world into darkness. While Ethan Chandler, Dr. Frankenstein, Dorian Gray, Sir Malcolm, The Creature, and Lily must each face their own monstrous selves. I'll wrap up the home entertainment slate with Blu-rays from the past, and this week, the spotlight first turns to the Harry Potter franchise, where Warner Brothers is re-releasing the entire eight-film series in preparation for next month's Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Each of these is a two-disc special edition with gorgeous new, somewhat minimalist covers. The Harry Potter films span 2001 to 2011 and are rated PG and PG-13. The spotlight now shifts to a favorite franchise of my youth, and that one is the Gremlins Collection. This set contains both films on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as Funko Pop vinyls of Gizmo and Stripe the Gremlin. The first film is Gremlins, a horror comedy from 1984 starring Zach Galligan, Phoebe Cates, and Hoyt Axton. A boy inadvertently breaks three important rules concerning his new pet and unleashes a horde of malevolently mischievous monsters on a small town, Okay, really, how hard is it to remember? No bright lights, no getting the mogwai wet, and absolutely no feeding after midnight, no matter how much he begs. It's simple. Gremlins is rated PG. The other title is what happens after you break those three rules. It's Gremlins 2, The New Batch, a horror comedy from 1990 starring Zach Galligan, Phoebe Cates, and John Glover. The Gremlins are back, and this time they've taken total control over the building of a media mogul. Okay, yes, this film was bad, <laughs> but for me, it was B-grade bad. <laughs> I just love the slapstick chaos and the absurdity. Gremlins 2, the new batch, is rated PG-13. There may be three rules for Mogwai, but there's only one rule right now. After a brief break for about a shameless podcast cross-promotion, the Weekly Podio Plex will return. Yes, we know there's a million podcasts out there, but there's only one Hollywood Outsider. Every week, your hoes, Aaron, Brian, Justin, and Scott, put their own spin on the latest in movie and TV news, new and upcoming releases, topics that are on ours or our listeners' minds, and hell, we even throw in some trivia where you can win a cavalcade of imaginary prizes. Most importantly, we have fun doing it. So come take a listen. The Hollywood Outsider is available on iTunes, Zoom, Stitcher Radio, or at thehollywoodoutsider.com. And welcome back to the Weekly Podioplex. I'm Denise with your Quick Flicks. You know, I love this job. 
it's not everyone who gets to research geeky things and then geek out over the geeky thing. And I'm not just talking squealing geeking out. I'm talking shouting at my computer with unfettered joy geeking out. Like I did with the fan-made Indiana Jones movie, which was quite literally the best one minute and 40 seconds of my day. Patrick Schoenmacher, you are my hero. Disney and Lucasfilm, please make it a series. In a year which has sucked in so, so many ways, we need good things in 2017. Now back to the geeking out. Fans of Agatha Christie will be excited to know Murder on the Orient Express will be hitting a theater near you. Kenneth Branagh, who is the greatest gift to cinema since the talking picture, is bringing a film adaptation to the famous Ecchio Poirot mystery. The plan from the get-go was to have Kenneth Branagh play the titular detective, as well as direct, with the remainder of the cast rounded out by either A-list stars or actors on or near equal critical standing as Sir Branagh. Thanks to THR, we now know who will make up the rest of the ensemble. The cast now includes Daisy Ridley as the nanny Mary Debenham, Michael Pena as Marquez, a Cuban passenger. Now, my first thought was Michael Pena would be playing Antonio Foscarelli, the Italian shopkeeper, but this does not seem to be the case sadly. Dame Judi Dench will be playing the Russian princess Dragomirov, and Tom Bateman is Monsieur Book. Johnny Depp and Michelle Pfeiffer will portray Mr. Ratchet and Mrs. Hubbard, respectively. Other cast members include Lucy Boynton, Derek Jacoby, and Leslie Odom Jr. of the Hamilton Persuasion. When asked, Sir Brana has had this to say. Christie's murder is mysterious, compelling, and unsettling. I'm honored to have this fantastic group of actors bring this dark material to life for a new audience. Now, this isn't the first time Murder on the Orient Express has seen screen time. It was adapted in 1974 into an Oscar-winning film by Sidney Lumet. There are some big shears to fill here, but if anyone can do it, it's Sir Brenna. Coming out of the DC Universe, Greg Rucka has confirmed Wonder Woman is in fact bisexual. When asked about whether Diana is queer by Comico City, Greg Rucka had this to say, Yes. I think it's more complicated though. This is inherently the problem with Diana. We've had a long history of people for a variety of reasons, including sometimes pure titillation, which I think is the worst reason, say, ooh, look, it's the Amazons, they're gay. And when you start to think about giving the concept of the mascara its due, the answer is, how can they not all be in same sex relationships, right? It makes no logical sense otherwise. It's supposed to be paradise. You're supposed to be able to live happily. You're supposed to be able in a context where one can live happily and part of what an individual needs for that happiness is to have a partner to have a fulfilling romantic and sexual relationship. And the only options are women. But an Amazon doesn't look at another Amazon and say, you're gay. They don't. The concept does not exist. Now, are we saying Diana has been in love and had relationships with other women? As Nicola and I approach it, the answer is obviously yes. Rucka went on to elaborate on the reason why Diana needs to have had same-sex relationships on the mascara, and it involves her commonly used male love interest, Steve Trevor. It needs to be yes for a number of reasons, but perhaps foremost among them is, if no, then she leaves paradise only because of a potential romantic relationship with Steve. And that diminishes her character. It would hurt the character and take away her heroism. When we talk about agency of characters in 2016, Diana deciding to leave her home forever, which is what she believes she's doing, if she does that because she's fallen for a guy, I believe that diminishes her heroism. She doesn't leave because of Steve. She leaves because she wants to see the world and somebody must go and do this thing. And she has resolved it must be her to make this sacrifice. Thank you, Mr. Rucka. It's needed to be said for a very long time. While Rucka stops short of explicitly ascribing a label to how Wonder Woman sexually identifies, the news comes as a welcome and refreshing change of pace in an otherwise maddening comic run. In other news I'm surprised at, Thomas Edison is getting his own movie. I know, steampunk fans, I know, historians, I know. These things you're thinking, this outrage you're feeling, I know, I understand. Still, Thomas Edison is getting his own movie courtesy of the Weinstein Company, titled The Current War. Fans of history will understand immediately what this title means for the movie. For those who don't, it's the battle of AC, alternating current, versus DC, direct current, and the competition to sway the masses for one side or the other. Take a look at the kind of current we use in the States to understand which side won. Here, anyway. Thomas Edison will be played by Benedict Cumberbatch, and now Deadline reports Michael Shannon is on board to play Westinghouse. 
It will be the first time these two acting powerhouses have shared the screen. I am only disappointed this movie isn't about Thomas Edison versus Nikolai Tesla. Not that the current war itself wasn't interesting, it really was, but because seriously, you guys, the guy we should be thanking for practically everything we enjoy in this modern age still doesn't, hasn't gotten his own movie. Though I've heard the cars bearing his name are pretty nice. The current war has no official release date. And finally, clowns are never fun, you guys. I don't care what people say. Clowns are awful, terrifying, and I wouldn't read it for almost 20 years because clown freaked me the hell out. I eventually listened to the book, which is highly recommended, but that's not the point. By now you've heard about or read about those creepy clown sightings popping up around the US. Probably you thought they were a marketing ploy for New Line's adaptation of Stephen King's It. They are not. In a statement, New Line has done its best to separate crazy people who wear clown suits and scare the bejesus out of people for fun and their movie, which is hitting theater soon. The clowns have also been linked to Rob Zombie's upcoming carnival flick called 31 and follows five carnival workers who are kidnapped and forced to survive a, a game called 31 while trying to evade murderous clowns. This is also not true, but clowns, guys, clowns. The first report of these sightings was in South Carolina when children reported seeing clowns outside their homes. Sightings have since been reported in New Jersey, Tennessee, Alabama, Pennsylvania, and more. Stephen King has commented on the whole thing. He told the Banger Daily that the clown furor will pass as these things do, but it will come back because under the right circumstances, clowns really can be terrifying. The author went on to discuss why he chose to have it dressed like a clown in his novel. I chose Pennywise the Clown as the face which the monster originally shows the kitties because kids love clowns, but they also fear them. King said, Clowns with their white faces and red lips are so different and so grotesque compared to normal people. Take a little kid to the circus and show him a clown, and he's more apt to scream with fear than laugh. Because 2016 isn't crazy enough. All right, everyone, that's it for this week's Quick Flicks. I'm Denise, and I'll catch you guys next week. Thank you, Denise. With that, we come to the end of this week's edition of the Weekly Podioplex. If you want to discuss anything you heard on this week's edition, please take a moment to get in touch. You can surf on over to the brand new homepage at chronicrift.com and leave an audio message right there on that website using your microphone. Or you can write to weeklypodioplex at gmail.com. Of course, you can still tweet us on Twitter. The Chronic Rift is at chronic underscore rift. The Weekly Podioplex is at Weekly Podioplex. Denise is at Riley James Keith. And I am at Womprat99, like the creature Liquid Bullseye in his T16 in Beggar's Canyon. You can give the Chronic Rift a thumbs up on Stitcher Radio, leave us a five star review on iTunes, and you can find the Weekly Podioplex and the Chronic Rift on Facebook and Google. Take a moment, stop on by, and see what other shows the Chronic Rift Network has to offer. The main show is offered weekly with the Rift regulars, and you can listen live or download the episode later in the feed. We also have Cyborgs, a bionic podcast, the Batcave podcast, the Hornet Sting podcast, the OSI Files podcast, the G2V podcast, Generations Geek, presenting the transcription feature, the Dan and Travis show, the Sci-Fi Diner podcast, and so much more. Check us out. And find the culture in pop culture. If you're interested in more of my adventures, take a quick trip to my blog, Creative Criticality, where I'm watching every episode of Doctor Who for the first time from the very beginning of the franchise and reviewing those tales in the Timestamps Project. Right now, the blog has just said goodbye to Sarah Jane Smith, but the adventure is not over. We're in the 14th season with the adventures of the fourth Doctor, and the link to those reviews can be found in the show notes. You can also find Creative Criticality on Facebook. Denise can also be found on the internet at Accessories Not Included, where she talks about her writing, reviews books, and offers her services as a cover designer. Check her out at AccessoriesNotIncluded.com. If you decide to pick up any of this week's new releases, why not do it through our Amazon store? You get the newest entertainment on Amazon's low prices and high quality service, and each purchase you make that store supports the Chronic Rift Network. Your support keeps us on the air, and we appreciate your consideration. Look for the links to our best bets and the network store in our show notes, or click the Amazon box on the website. The Weekly Patio Plex is a Lucky Shot production and is produced by John S. Drew. On behalf of Denise and John, this is Michael Faulkner. Thanks for listening. Until next time, there are adventures and drama, comedy and action, worlds to explore in the depths of film. Get some popcorn, find your favorite seat. 
and I'll see you at the theater. That's a wrap.